please consider partnering with me on Patreon like these rockstar Patreons. Company Ru proved to be a burden too hard to carry for the Ndebele and Shona natives from forced labor to punitive taxes. This made the Shona and Ndebele spiritual leaders plan an uprising right under the noses of the settlers. Umlimo, the Ndebele spiritual leader, had put in place a plan. He told his subjects that the settlers, who were almost 4,000 in population at the time, were responsible for the drought, locust plagues, and the cattle disease rinder pest ravaging the country at the time. The uprising was planned for the night of the 29th of March, the first full moon. He had picked the perfect time to execute this plan. The whole country was almost defenseless because a few months earlier, the British South Africa Company Administrator General for Matebele Land, Leander Star Jameson, had sent most of his troops and armaments to fight the Transvaal Republic in the ill-fated Jameson Raid. However, several young Debele men were eager for war and the rebellion started prematurely. On the 20th of March, Debele warriors shot and stabbed a native policeman. Over the next few days, other outlying settlers and prospectors were killed. Frederick Selou, the big game hunter, had heard rumors of settlers in the countryside being killed, but he thought it was a localized problem. However, when news of the policeman's murder reached Selou on the 23rd of March, he knew the Ndebele had started a massive uprising. Nearly 2,000 Ndebele warriors began the rebellion in earnest on the 24th of March. Many, although not all, of the young native police quickly deserted and joined the Ndebele warriors. The Ndebele warriors headed into the countryside armed with a variety of weapons, including Martini Henry rifles, Winchester repeaters, Lee Metfords, Assegais, Knob Carries, and Battle Axes. As the news of the massive rebellion spread, the Shona joined in the fighting, and the settlers headed towards Bulawayo. Within a week, 141 settlers were slain in Matebele land, another 103 in Mashona land, and hundreds of homes, ranches, and mines were burnt. Umlimo's plan was to kill all the settlers in Blawayo first, but not to destroy the town itself, as it would serve again as the royal crow for the newly reincarnated King Lobengula. The Umlimo decreed that the settlers should be attacked and driven out of the country through the Mangwe Pass on the western edge of the Matobo Hills, which was to be left open and unguarded for this reason. Once the settlers were purged in Bulawayo, the Ndebele and Shona warriors would head out into the countryside and continue the slaughter until all settlers were either killed or had fled. With few troops to support them, the settlers resorted to building a lager of sandbagged wagons in the center of Lawayo. Barbed wire and smashed glass bottles were spread around the front of the wagons. Without much weaponry, they used hunting rifles and a small assortment of machine guns. They resorted to mounting patrols called the Bulawayo Field Force under such figures as Selu and Frederick Russell Burnham. These rode out to rescue any surviving settlers in the countryside and occasionally attacked Ndebele warriors. But within the first week of fighting, 20 men of the Bulawayo Field Force were killed and another 50 wounded. Although 10,000 Ndebele warriors surrounded the town, they avoided entering Bulawayo outright for fear of the notorious Maxim machine guns, which had been used against Lobengula's forces. However, conditions inside Bulawayo quickly became unbearable. During the day, settlers could go to homes and buildings within the town, but at night, they were forced to seek shelter in the much smaller lager. Nearly 1,000 women and children were crowded into the city, and false alarms of attacks were common. The Ndebele warriors made one big mistake that would cost them the war. They neglected to cut the telegraph lines connecting Blawayo to Mafikeng. This gave both the relief forces and the besieged Bulawayo Field Force far more information than they would otherwise have had. The British South Africa Company organized several relief to break up the siege, but the long trek through the hostile countryside took several months. Late in May, the first two relief columns appeared near Blawayo on almost the same day, from opposite directions. Cecil John Rhodes and Colonel Bill arrived from Salisbury and Fort Victoria in Marshonaland, 300 miles north, and Lord Grey and Colonel Plummer of the York and Lancaster Regiment from Kimberley and Mafikeng. 600 miles to the south. The Southern Relief Forces resorted to using Maxim machine guns on the Ndebele warriors on their way to Blawayo. Not long after that, relief forces began arriving in Blawayo. General Frederick Carrington arrived to take over a command along with his chief of staff, Colonel Biden Powell. Only then was the siege of Blawayo broken. 
An estimated 50,000 Debele warriors retreated into their stronghold of the Matobo Hills near Bulawayo. This region became the scene of the fiercest fighting between the settler patrols and the Ndebele. By June, the Shona kept their promise and joined the fighting on the side of the Ndebele. The Umvukele, or First Chimurenga, was well underway. The British South Africa Company, military intelligence at the time, thought that capturing the Umlimu would be the speediest way to end the war. The location of Umlimu's cave had been disclosed to the native commissioner at Mangwe, Bona Armstrong, by an unnamed Zulu informant. The military commander, Carrington, instructed Burnham, Armstrong and Baden Powell to leave that very night to kill the Debele spiritual leader. Baden Powell ended up attending other matters, so Burnham and Armstrong proceeded on their way to Matopos. Burnham and Armstrong traveled by night through the Matobo Hills and approached the sacred cave. Not far from the cave was a village of about 100 huts filled with many warriors. The two scouts tethered their horses to a thicket and crawled on their bellies into the cave. They waited for Umlimo to enter. Once Umlimo started his dance of immunity, Burnham shot him just below the heart, killing him instantly. The two men then leapt over the dead Umlimo's body and ran down the trail towards their horses. Hundreds of warriors encamped nearby picked up their arms and started in pursuit. Benham set fire to the villages as a distraction. The two men hurried back to Lawayo with warriors in pursuit. Now there's no consensus whether Umlimo was really killed in this altercation. There were several court trials held concerning this ordeal in subsequent years, and historians till now do not know truly whether it was the real Umlimo who was assassinated. Upon learning of Umlimo's death, Cecil John Rhodes walked into the Matebele stronghold and persuaded Ndebele warriors to lay down their arms. With the war in Matebele land effectively over, the Bulawayo field force disbanded on the 4th of July, 1896. But things were far from over in Mashona land. On the 17th of June, 1896, war broke out at Mazoe with an attack by the Wata dynasty on Alice Mine. This was followed by the medium Neanda Nyakasikana, capturing and executing Mazoe native commissioner Pollard. Other religious figures who led the first Chumrenga included Kaguvi Gumbare Shumba, also known as Sekuru Kaguvi, who were active in the Goromonzi area, and Mukwati, a priest of the Mwari Shrine, who was active throughout Mashona land. In addition to the spiritual, traditional leaders played a major role in the rebellion, notably Chief Mashaya Mombe who led the resistance in his chieftaincy in Mondoro, south of the colonial settlement of Salisbury, which is now Harare. He was amongst the first chiefs to rebel and the last to be defeated. He was supplied by many of the surrounding districts, such as Chikomba. Other chiefs who played an important role included Guabayana, Makoni, Mapondera, Mangwende, and Seke. But the Maxim guns, which were utilized by General Carrington, proved too powerful against the weapons used by the Shona forces. Perhaps what made the Shona resistance not much effective was the lack of a central command against the settlers. This is why Carrington was able to attack each stronghold in turn until the resistance ended. Nehanda Nyakasikana and Kaguvi Gumbare Shumba were captured and executed in March 1898 in Harare. The tree which they were hung was along Josiah Tongogara Street. It fell a few years back after a motorist rammed into it. However, the last words of Nehanda Nyakasikana would inspire the second Chimurenga over 70 years later. She said, Mapupango Achamuka, my bones will rise again. She was charged with the murder of Native Commissioner Henry Hawkins Pollard in 1896. She was found guilty after eyewitness claimed that she had ordered an associate to chop Pollard's head off. Mokwati was never captured. He later died in Mutoko. The killing of Nehanda in Kaguvi would pretty much signal the end of the first Chimurenga. Although several rebellions would continue to take place in the years following the first Chimurenga, including the 1901 Mapondera Rebellion, where Chief Kadungure Mapondera, who had in 1894 proclaimed his independence of company rule, led a rebellion in the Guruve and Mount Darwin areas of Mashonal and Central. He led a force of initially under 100 men, but he had over 600 under his command by mid-1901. He was captured in 1903 and died in jail in 1904 after a hunger strike. 
This, in a nutshell, was the first Chimurenga. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. See you in the next video.